welcome here on Martial Arts. Today we have an opportunity to talk with Mafundi Dennis Brown. It's a pleasure having you with us today right. on Martial Arts Today. Uh, I'm going to, now you and I have chatted before and Matt and we've talked, matter of fact you've been a guest on the show before, mm -hmm. but I'm going to go through some of the preliminaries for the people who have never had an opportunity to meet you and to hear some of the aspects of Shaolin Wushu. I guess the first thing I'm going to ask you is, how did you get started in the martial arts? How old were you and what style was it? Oh, well, when I started, I, I, I wasn't really a small kid as, as most people like to think. You know, I started when I was five. I wish I had. I was probably in my teens, late teens, uh, 17, 18 years old back. Uh, in the early 60s, let's say mid, right. yeah, mid to early 60s, and at that time uh, there weren't really many kung fu schools around, so we kind of just joined the first kung fu group we could get with. All right, uh, where was that location-wise? Actually, that was in uh, Dayton, uh, Dayton, Ohio. I had just gotten out of high school and went up there to work, run computers for the uh, Air Force Base up there, right. and uh, ran into a family that taught kung fu because okay. at that time. If you weren't Chinese, you, there were no schools for you to study in, yeah, so yeah. actually in the backyard of somebody's house. How did you end up choosing Kung Fu? I mean, like right away. Well, you know, I was from Washington, D.C., which is basically a Taekwondo town. <laughs> I mean, uh, Master Jun Ri was there, and at the time he had the biggest schools going, and uh, everybody studied uh, Taekwondo. Uh, I kind of walked into Kung Fu. I had no idea what it was. That, this was pre-Bruce Lee dynasty. Yeah. Uh, it, there was no David Carradine's then yeah, yeah. and there were very few kung fu movies so we kind of walked into it and I was kind of drawn to it because of the the flow. I thought it was a beautiful system. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how effective it was but I, I liked the movements and I was kind of a small guy so I thought that would be great for me. All right as you progressed in your studies what would you say was the next um, you know big step or, or alteration in the direction of your training in the martial arts? Well actually you know when I came back to Washington DC uh, there was a little kung fu club there that I thought I would be able to get back into and start to work with. They were working in the basement of a church still there were no kung fu schools. I actually joined a uh, karate school uh, there in DC for a short period of time and did quite well, even though I was the only guy that was, was doing Taekwondo with Kung Fu stances. stances. And even then, they, they would always point to me and go, that's the guy over there that does that Kung Fu stuff. Uh, this was, I guess, 69 or 70. Yeah. And actually, uh, I, the big step came. I was leaving the school one uh, day, and I passed this studio, and I saw this Chinese guy out nailing up a sign that said, uh, Lin's Karate Studio. And then in real small letters, it said, <laughs> Kung Fu, Chinese boxing. So I kind of stepped in and to my surprise I found out I was his first student. Uh, I immediately joined his school because I said, okay, this is a chance to get back in with some of the stuff I had worked with an early instructor in Ohio uh, with. And uh, I had the privilege of being his only student for about six months. Oh, you know, so it shot me right <laughs> off. Yeah, I mm -hmm. guess so. Now you train uh, along with your training, we'll just bring it in now, you've trained in China. Yeah. yeah been fortunate enough to train in, in uh, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China a couple times. Now you acquired a degree. You graduated from one of their... Yeah, in, in 82 we went there and we got, a, got our piece of paper in from Nanjing. Yes. And then we went back in 85 and, and got certified there in Beijing at the uh, Sports Institute, which is the top uh, learning center for Wushu in mainland China. Okay, now while you were there, you said something interesting once when we were chatting and I just want to bring it back in. Um, you said that while you were there in China, one of the nice things was that they didn't take a stand that they wouldn't teach you anything. Mm -hmm. What was the position? Well, their thing was I'd always say, uh, can I learn that? I, as if, you know, is that a big secret? Is that something I, I'm not yeah, going to learn? Yeah. And they would always ask me with, well, can you learn it? Yeah. But what they meant is, can you physically do it? Can you learn it? I mean, we'll teach it to you. Yes. But the question is, can you learn it? Uh, we'll teach it to you. If as you can do it, but don't ask us to teach you anything that you're not ready for. Okay. And that was the only only holdback. If that it, was it. They didn't want you to uh, ask for something. You know, it's like kind of like when you came up and your grandmother said, I'll give you as much food as you want as long as you eat it. We don't want you to waste that's it. it. That's it. So that's we're not going to give you anything if you can't do it. It's a waste of our time. That's right. And that's, and I think that is the, the hole in the martial arts, and that is there are no secrets. It's mm -hmm. just hard work. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, anybody that understands whether it be uh, a Tai Chi, Shaolin Wushu, uh, Taekwondo, Okinawan Goju Ru, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. The truth is, uh, 
if you're willing to work and learn, then yeah, you, and, the, and the instructor knows it, and it's any traditional line, they'll, they'll teach it to you yeah. if you're ready to learn it. Well, I was used to that because my instructor, my first instructor, that was his thing. Uh, you know, I'll teach you something, uh, but don't abuse it. I mean, don't, yeah. I want to have learned this form. When can I learn my next? It got to the point where I knew not to ask for anything. Yes. I would just work really hard, work really hard, and I'd look to see if he's looking at me. And hopefully, sooner or later, he'll look at me and go, okay, this guy's ready for something else. Something else. But, uh, so I was kind of used to that type That's of thing. That's good. That's great. You're, you're married, have a family? Oh, yeah. And then the, in the arts? Have, well, my two little girls, I have them compete. In fact, they competed and won their first little trophies at a tournament <laughs> recently. So, you know, we've got everybody pumped up. That's great. The That's wife, she couldn't throw a if her life depended on it. Just, but we're yeah. working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> Always working on it. I like that. Yeah. Do you think that the martial arts um, has played an important role in your personal life, your family life? Oh, uh, yeah, of course. You know, the, the teachings, for me, martial arts is a way of life. It's not just kick, punch, and block. I think if it was just about fighting and uh, competing that I would have gotten out of the years ago. I mean, if it was about fighting, I would have taken maybe a year or two, found out that it's very easy to the average person in the street and well yeah. let's go do something else yeah. if it was about competition after you get the three or four hundred trophy the wife don't want you to bring them in anymore them in, right? you 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 start to get out of it then but for me it's a way of life it's it's been it's changed my life I, i've been around the world i've had a chance to write books i've had my own radio show i've done movies you know i sit back and think about all the things that i've been able to do i know that i probably would not have been able to touch on these things uh if it was for the martial arts. So for yeah. me personally, it's uh, it's taken me a long ways. Okay. I've had a good time with it. it some of, now we'll have some viewers that'll go in and look some stuff up. What are some of the magazines? I know two or three. What are some of the magazines you've had features on yourself done in over the years? Oh, well, we've hit all of them. There's everything from the sports karate. We've appeared in official karate and American right. karate and. Karate Illustrated, Black Belt Magazine, Kung Fu. Inside Kung Fu. Yeah. You know, we've done. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to be on the cover of most of those. And so, uh, if they check any of those uh, publishing agencies, they may be able to get a back issue. If they don't have it, they may be able to get information on what issue. There was some articles regarding yourself and 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 your rope dark kata. Oh yeah. yeah oh yeah. yeah we, we got a lot of from that because it was such a strange weapon. Yeah. The now the rope dark kata. We, right. Yes, yeah, you is, have it with you right rope here. Dark. All right, now, how'd you get started with this? Well, you know, this is a strange weapon because there are only a few people that still work this weapon. It's actually a nine-foot rope with a big chunk of steel on the end. And my instructor used to work something called a meter ball, which was a rope with a round steel ball on yeah. the end, but you had to swing it and catch it and swing it. And it was the only weapon that we never were able to learn. So when I got to China, of course, they said, well, what do you want to learn? And I said, well, look, the rope dart. <laughs> and they said, well, no, not quite yet, because that's a little bit rough for your level. And so I learned the broadsword and straight sword. And they said, well, what else do you want to learn? I said, the rope dart. <laughs> and it go on like that after about three months. Finally, they gave in and said, OK, we'll try to let you learn this thing. What I didn't know is this was not like the meter ball. The meter ball, you do a little something, you catch it, and you do something. This thing is constantly moving from one change, and it's a very deceptive weapon. I did what I didn't know when I asked for it was that there were only about eight people in China who still trained in this weapon. So for them to teach it to me was really an honor. So I've tried to spread the word about it every place That's I could go. That's great. Well, mm -hmm. let's just take a minute. and We're going to look over at this monitor and look at you demonstrating some of the aspects of the rope dart con. Now with Mafundi Dennis Brown, known nationally for his skill in the rope dart kata, this form referred to as the Silver Dragon's Tongue. He trained in Nanqing, excuse me, Nanqing, China. Had been there on more than one occasion training. It should be realized that the, the red cloth gives you an idea where the dart is. The dart can weigh anywhere from three to six pounds. It's to encircle the body and appear to be entwined, tangled, so that it can't be released and yet can be in any direction pre-chosen by the person executing the form. Obviously, concerns in the use and the practice of this would involve being struck in any part of the body as well as the skull, chin, 
teeth areas. It's not for amateurs. No matter how skilled or professional a martial artist might be, this is not a tool that you just pick up and decide to practice with. This Chinese tool, as Dennis was explaining to me earlier, was to bridge the gap from the swords and the spears to a tool or a weapon that could be used by the Chinese by being thrown and yet retrieved and used again. And you can see how smoothly and almost effortlessly this man executes the use of the rope dart kata. Magnificent, just magnificent. His enthusiasm and love for this was stimulating. Just beautiful. The idea about the rope dart is that it's supposed to be a deceptive weapon. The idea is that you should be able to strike with parts of the body that it doesn't appear that you can throw the weapon or strike with the weapon. Yeah. Uh, you should be able to shoot it in one direction when it appears to be going in another direction. And uh, the whole idea is that you should be able to use it even when it appears there's no way you can use it. So you might tie yourself up around the way through the leg or the neck or what have you, and all of a sudden the person thinks, well, he's all tangled up, then the weapon shoots out again. Yeah. So it was, it was a very deceptive weapon. What's going on right now? They're working a uh, kata uh, in unison called Suchi Chuan or Youth Fist, the beginning fist in, this, in the system. And uh, that's just a sequence of movements to uh, give them technique to work on. Then they can go off individually on their own and work this form or this kata and uh, you know drill the, the, the techniques until they're comfortable. Then we come back later and show them the application to these movements then they can uh, gradually work that until they feel comfortable and then we uh, adapt that those movements to the free fighting okay. so it's a step by step process yep i see good The Wushu students here at Washington, D.C. have demonstrated that positive enthusiasm that we see from all good martial artists. Mafundi Dennis Brown's enthusiasm on behalf of his students and his eagerness to teach 
is demonstrated by his involvement in all the aspects of the program. Here, as he oversees sparring between a couple of the students, he's not only looking for technique and skill, but safety. And he keeps an eye on both students and concludes with compliments to each student that sparred. His enthusiasm and his sincerity is demonstrated in all the aspects that he carries out in his Wushu schools. Now, what's the young lady doing right now? Uh, we call this a kata or form. And the way this works is they work on this kata until they feel comfortable again with the movement. And then once they've learned it and they have the technique down, we put someone in front of them and have that person working with them to learn application. All right. So that's what's going to happen right yeah, now. So now. Okay. The next young lady will come out and they will work that same form. You'll notice the exact same thing. In mm -hmm. fact, one person is doing the first half, the other person is doing the second half, and if they do it well, then the techniques should match. Okay. Well, along the same line now, Shaolin Wushu, mm -hmm. now that, that being your, your style, what, um, what are some of the attributes, the characteristics, the thing that adhere you to it? All right. Well, you know, I, I like it because it's a, such a complex system. It, most people think of Kung Fu or, or Wushu as being a very flowing system and the very flowery moves and that whole thing. Uh, but we had, there are hard uh, 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 styles in it. They're soft. They're internal. They're external. They're long weapons and short weapons and fighting sets and single sets. And it's, it's just so much. You could study it forever. Uh, as I found out after 20 years or so and then going to yeah. China and finding out that there's a whole other group of stuff that I've never even seen to the Shaolin. Uh, the system that we work, you know, they, you can do, there's China, which is the grappling systems involved in it. Uh, where, so we don't have to study, say, either Jiu-Jitsu or Aikido would be a throwing art or, or Judo or grappling art. Uh, and then you'd have your other systems that deal in kicking. Well, we have a little bit of all of it in there. And because it deals with redirection or off-angling uh, rather than direct power, uh, the flow was just good for me. Yeah, that's you great. Know? All right. Well, I, in in as far as uh, age group, uh, is there to learn Shaolin Wushu? Would you say there's an age group uh, that it's more applicable to, or is it uh, five years old to 105? Well, what we start them about four years old, and and the oldest I think we've ever taught is about 85. It all goes right. on a, because you know you might not you get to a point where maybe you don't do the contemporary Wushu with all the flips and all yeah. that stuff. But then it goes all the way to the Tai Chi, which is included in, in the Shaolin Wushu yeah. style that we do. And it's meditation, and you can do that at any age. Yeah. At yeah. any age, you know. I think that's one of the key backbones to the martial arts that a lot of Americans are finding, and that is that there's a, you know, the, the mental concentration, the relaxation that can be acquired through meditation yeah. is a daily, you know, benefit. I look for the 90s. Uh, believe it or not, to, to be the, the uh, age of the internal systems. I mean, in the 50s, I like to say it was judo. In the 60s, uh, a lot of the karate systems came into their own. In the 70s, yeah. we got outshot with kung fu. Yeah. And I don't think anybody can question that the 80s has been ninjutsu. Yes. Oh, and yeah. in the 90s, I believe that you're going to see a rise of taiji, aikido, some of the systems that are thought to be internal style systems more so than external. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking forward to that because yeah. it shows another side to the martial arts. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah, and, and every every country has their internal systems. I mean, the Chinese we have the Tai Chi, but if you go to Japan, they have Aikido, and everybody has some type of internal system. That, but it hasn't been the big system that was yeah. shown because yeah. it's not very colorful. But yeah. I think mentally we're just about ready for that now. Yeah, I'm. With so many things going on in the martial arts, I, I guess the last thing I want to ask or give you an opportunity to share with us uh, is what kind of goal do you still have set for yourself that have not yet been achieved in the realm of the arts that you're looking forward to still doing? Well, I, I like to think that uh, my purpose is to spread the, the, the true meaning of the art. For so many years, people have not understood it. We went everywhere from bullies, you know, the karate kung fu guys that just were almost thugs to where it's getting yeah. a little more sophisticated, but there's still so many sides of the art that uh, are, are not being uh, utilized. I, I think that martial arts is a great 
school for teaching. I'd like to see it in every school. I'd like to be a part of yeah. getting it into the Olympics, which some of it is getting into now. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see it in the universities. And uh, the day when it would be like in uh, mainland China, where the instead of taking a coffee break, they take a 15-minute break and go out and do Tai Chi or some type of exercise or martial arts yeah. to start to keep the, to work towards getting the mental uh, yeah. mass of people strong. Yeah. In this country, we've already got into that physically. That is, we jog have you and we're into that but mentally we need an exercise that's going to keep us uh, strong as a people and I think uh, that martial arts can do that it can be the art for that and I'd like to be a part of that yeah and that's and I and I'm glad to hear you say that I um, I believe that yeah as a student of the martial arts and a teacher of the martial arts the next normal stage is to promote and to, to have other people have the opportunity to share what, what yeah. we found what you found that's great and you know the the martial arts or uh, sports has always been one of the common denominators that could bring all different countries together, no yeah. matter their religions or beliefs. And uh, we're doing a lot of things with China and the Orient uh, right now, and uh, we're finding that maybe martial arts might be the key to to bridging to that gap initially between yeah. some of the uh, yeah. eastern countries and western countries because they believe very heavily in this and they've done it all their lives, and now we're getting into and now it. We're into and it. maybe we could be the ambassador of. Yeah. between the two. Yeah. And it's definitely American culture now. It's definitely oh, yeah. a part we, of us. We have our own American martial arts. Yes, effect. without a doubt. Well, I'm, I'm really excited that you took this time uh, to spend with us and to spend with our viewers and to chat with us mm -hmm. about all of your personal experience as well as Shaolin Wushu, the rope dart kata. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, with you and many other people in the world, I'm sure, are hoping that the martial arts is that thread, uh, that it's become Shaolin, no matter style it is has become an integral part of the American culture and through that involvement now in American culture will touch us with the rest of the, the countries in the world. Well you're doing so. a great job here and if we <laughs> keep, keep keeping these type of shows coming we'll get the word out to well, the people. That's awful nice. Well thank you for being with us today thank you for having on us Martial in. Arts Today. And we're going to take a break right now, and again, a pleasure having with us Mafundi Dennis Brown, and just an exciting opportunity. I hope you enjoyed it uh, half as much as I did. Take that break right now. The Martial Arts Today show aired on NBC for 12 years, reaching over 3 million homes in the United States and Canada. Its host, Grandmaster Clifford C. Crandall, Jr., traveled to 22 countries covering diverse martial arts styles and events. Grandmaster Crandall is the founder of the American Martial Arts Institute and American Eagle Style. He has made numerous contributions to the field of martial arts, producing instructional videos, books, including the American Eagle Style textbook and the American Eagle Style self-defense DVD. These resources share the American Eagle Style with the world and help its instructors teach its students. In addition to traveling around the world as host of the Martial Arts Today show, Grandmaster Crandall has led several martial arts teams on international cultural exchange tours. In 1994, he coached and led the first American martial arts team to perform by government invitation for the People's Republic of China. The team carried letters from President Clinton, Vice President Gore, and numerous senators and congressmen. The presidential letter was read before each performance. A 30-minute documentary was produced to chronicle the trip and its historic significance. He led similar trips to Russia, Japan, Australia, Italy, and the Caribbean. Grandmaster Crandall has appeared in many martial arts magazines, promoting safety and awareness for people of all ages and abilities. He has promoted child safety internationally, is the Central New York spokesperson for McDonald's Corporation, and set a Guinness Book World Record for breaking boards while skydiving as a publicity effort for the need for child safety education. Grandmaster Crandall is also the headmaster of Takanuchi Hanganru Matsuno Crandall, a 300-year-old Iaido style. Grandmaster Crandall's certified position and title were bestowed to him by his late instructor, Headmaster Tsuni Yoshi Matsuno, during a traditional ceremony in Japan in June of 2002. Grandmaster Crandall has documented these styles in both textbook and DVD format. Prior to becoming a full-time professional martial artist, Grandmaster Crandall was a superintendent of schools, a high school principal, an elementary school principal, and a classroom teacher in the state of New York. To learn more about Grandmaster Crandall and the American Martial Arts Institute, visit www.amai-eaglestyle.com. <laughs>